before the crash, Hunt had been confident that he would never lose out. Uh, you could if you did it on credit. Uh, I think in, uh, in investing in anything, if you do it on credit, of course, if the price comes down, then you're in serious trouble. If you do it as an investment, uh, paying uh, cash for it, then I think you're over the long pull, you're in pretty good shape. That was Nelson Bunker Hunt, an original Silver Squeezer who made the mistake of not taking his own advice. In this Hunt Brothers Silver Squeeze video, we cover some history on what happened to the original silver price run to 50 fiat Fed notes per troy ounce by early 1980. And as you can see by this price chart spanning from 1975 to the end of 1981, all four major precious metal prices exponentially spiked within months of one another, as the then Fiat Federal Reserve note was being called to account for all the debasement and deficit spending throughout the end of the Bretton Woods era and into the less than one decade old full fiat currency era. It's a tale involving the Bank of England in a panic that brought the West's financial system within a hair's breadth of a crash like 1929. The true story is so good, someone may even bid for the film rights. The Ewing family of that television soap opera is based loosely on a real-life oil millionaire family who live in Big D. The main difference between them is that the real family have a burning ambition to corner the world's silver market, an ambition that led two weeks ago to the biggest crash in its history. The real life star is Nelson Bunker Hunt, eldest of four sons of the Dallas oil tycoon H.L. Hunt who died in 1974, leaving a billion dollar fortune to the family. The following article readings are from the December 1980 issue of the American Opinion magazine. Author of this article is Gary Allen, who was an American conservative writer and a former advisor to the conservative Texas millionaire, Nelson Bunker Hunt. Nelson Bunker Hunt, fabled son of the legendary billionaire H.L. Hunt of Texas, has been called Silverfinger by financial journalists eager to dramatize his silver investments in the purple ad homonyms of a James Bond novel. Hunt is neither an eccentric villain out of James Bond nor a sinister schemer in the mold of J.R. Ewing of the Dallas television series. He's in fact a happy combination of sober realist and idealistic visionary. He's a sober realist because he understands the perilous direction in which our civilization has been headed, the political instability, the civil turmoil, the financial catastrophe of hyperinflation and moral bankruptcy, and he's an idealistic visionary because he is working for a better world in which the people govern themselves and their economy without being victimized by a paper aristocracy which profits by manipulating government and inflating currencies. Mr. Hunt is a faithful Christian, friendly, unassuming, and temperate. He refrains from both liquor and tobacco, flies tourist class on commercial airlines, and dresses simply. A member of the National Council of the John Birch Society, he is a determined patriot and a formidable opponent of the establishment insiders who seek to make America one more colony in a new world order. Earlier this year, Bunker Hunt and his brother Herbert were targets of one of the most spectacular swindles in financial history. This was barked by the now infamous silver crash that culminated on March 27, 1980. But before we describe this biggest holdup since the Brinks job, let's examine some of the reasons the Texas billionaire set out to acquire 100 million ounces of silver rather than, say, a million pounds of kumquats. It's been alleged by the usual establishment propagandists that the Hunt brothers were irresponsible speculators in silver, and that it was their actions that produced the silver debacle. But Bunker Hunt was not a spec speculator in silver. Speculators are short-term players. They do not buy their holdings to keep, as Hunt was doing and continues to do. People gamble on the future price of pork bellies to make money in a relative short period, not as a long-term investment. With gold and silver, on the other hand, there are many who, like the Hunts, see the metals as cash and prefer them to paper money. They are investors for the long term. Thus, Bunker Hunt put a fortune in silver for three reasons. Number one, Mr. Hunt is aware that for the past 20 years, world production of silver has been in the neighborhood of 300 million ounces annually, while consumption has been about 500 million ounces. This means that every year the world comes up short of silver by about 200 million ounces. This shortfall has been made up from silver mined and stored over hundreds of years. Since about a third of the world's silver is in the form of jewelry in India and is locked up there because of India's government's prohibition of its export, Bunker Hunt quickly calculated that the shortfall would soon consume all the available reserves of silver and produce a price squeeze. The price of silver was bound to rise dramatically. Number two, most people still listen to 
Walter Cronkite telling them that inflation is rising prices, but Mr. Hunt knows that rising prices are the effect of inflation and that the cause is huge federal deficits that are spun out into the economy as fiat credit and currency. Bunker believes that the politicians will continue to pump money into the economy and, in effect, buying votes from unproductive to be paid for by reducing the value of the savings of the productive. Deficit money takes on value only by diluting the purchasing power of all the money that is already in circulation. Mr. Hunt realizes that this process might continue until it takes a wheelbarrow full of Washingtons and Lincolns to buy a Big Mac. Number three, should the purchasing power of our currency approach zero in a hyperinflationary nightmare, the people would demand a more stable means of exchange. At that time, gold would be too precious to be used in everyday monetary transactions of the average citizen, and silver coins would once again become a means of exchange. But it will not be the face value that is stamped on the coin, which is important. For instance, 10 cents, 25 cents, 50 cents, but the silver content of the coins. A dime might have the same purchasing power as a $10 in currency. For these three reasons, the Hunts began buying silver in the 1970s as a hedge against inflation and political chaos, an investment that had to increase in value due to the increasing short supply in comparison to the increasing world demand of the metal. Nevertheless, some have accused the Hunts of trying to quote-unquote corner the silver market. To quote-unquote corner a market, one would have to acquire enough of a central commodity to obtain a virtual monopoly on it and be able to arbitrarily set the price. That was not the Hunt objective. As Alan Trussman observes in the September issue of Atlantic, Quote, their behavior was not typical of that of coroners. In the first place, they told everybody who would listen what they were doing. They were big, big buyers and intended to buy more and more. A coroner operates in secret until he owns substantially the entire available supply, and then he squeezes the surprised innocents who have sold short and must buy in higher. You would have to have been belligerently deaf and disbelieving in anything but innocent to sell short, and then be caught surprised if Nelson Bunker and William Herbert had cornered silver and demanded that you deliver. Everybody knew they were buying and willing to pay a higher price. Silver, like gold, is a favorite haven for speculators when the going gets rough. But don't be fooled by that deceptive calm in the market. They're still sorting out the mess caused by the biggest crash in its history two weeks ago. In six years, Nelson and his brothers with their ranches, real estate, horses, oil wells, have turned that legacy into a five billion dollar well, I, I don't really keep track of, uh, of uh, I never, never count my money. I just want to enjoy life, and uh, I don't have to. I, in my business, I suspect I'm uh, on the overly aggressive side. For many people, the family silver is their most prized possession. But silver is widely used in industry, in photography, in dentistry, and medicine. It's still a monetary metal in many countries. The higher the price, the more it hurts to buy wedding presents, take holiday snaps. Gold might hog the limelight, but silver's always had a special appeal for the speculator. Bunker Hunt's ambition to own all the silver in the world takes more money than even he can muster. The only people with wealth to match are the oil sheikhs. Hunt persuaded a number of Saudi princes to back his play. At first they hesitated, but when the Shah fell in neighboring Iran last year, they rushed in. Henry Kissinger has told brokers in New York privately that some sheikhs reckon they have five years before they too are overthrown. So it's prudent to save for exile and silver and gold keep their value. In the second place, they never tried to squeeze anyone. They took their delivery slowly, over many months, even accepted in settlement of some of their contracts, non-certified silver, not on deposit, with the exchanges and gracefully rolled the bulk of their futures forward into later and later months so as not to squeeze the sellers. Corners? Not quite. While it's true that the Hunts wished to acquire large quantities of silver, as we have noted, they had the soundest of reasons for doing so, which is why they went into the futures market. As silver's price continued to go up, the value of the Hunt's silver futures rose rapidly, and those paper profits were used to borrow more money with which to buy more silver futures positions. As this mountain of silver grew with the rise in price, the quote-unquote shorts, who had agreed to deliver silver they didn't have, and therefore had to buy silver at increasingly higher prices to fulfill their contracts, grew progressively more nervous. Those who got heavily short in a rising market lose. Having to purchase silver at a high price in order to deliver it for a low price is not a good situation in which to find oneself. But just like every other player, the quote-unquote shorts knew the risks when they contracted. They were all over 21 and none arrived in town atop a wagon load of pumpkins. Mr. Trussman reports what happened. Quote, the short sellers of silver were very short and in very hot water. They had plenty of advance warning, and as one month after another rolled around, where the longs never tried to squeeze the shorts, and could not have done so, 
even if they wished to, the CFTC and the ruling bodies of the exchanges looking on, it became more and more difficult to sympathize with the short sellers of silver. But short they were, facing the prospect of enormous crushing losses. In other words, these players had made a mistake in the market, a crucial mistake. Trustman continues, Silver was going out of control. As the price of silver mounted, it became ridiculous in the eyes of many exchange members. $6 an ounce, $7 for silver? Sooner or later, the bubble would break. If not, they could always make it break. It would be their duty, they would claim, to make the price break for the benefit of the makers and users of silver and for the protection of the public. And some of them, we suspected and now know from the CFTC, shorted silver, selling futures on silver they did not own. The higher the price of silver went, the more the shorts stood to lose. Facing enormous losses, some of them used their influence on the governing bodies of the commodity exchanges to sabotage the market and support the shorts at the expense of the longs, primarily the Hunt brothers. They did this by getting the exchanges to change the rules in the middle of the game. As Herbert Hunt later remarked, to put it in terms of a football analogy, the game starts, the rules are changed, and finally when you get to the last quarter, the referee says, only the other side can have the ball. silver market is where the big players like Bunker Hunt stake their millions. With his own fortune now linked to Saudi billions, Hunt was the biggest player of all. When Hunt started buying silver in earnest in January 1979, the price was a little over six dollars an ounce. Hunt watchers reckoned that he owned about 50 million ounces. Hunt bought steadily throughout the whole of the year. By January 1980, when the price peaked at $52, Bunker Hunt had stashed away, say the market men, about 150 million ounces, between a third and two-thirds of one year's supply. Despite the series of margin increases made by the exchanges, however, the price of silver did not fall. The rule changes hadn't worked. Only the little traders were forced to sell, and they didn't own very much silver compared to the big investors. Price of silver stayed up around the $15 to $16 range in October 1979. The insiders on the exchanges, millions of ounces short, were now desperate. Silver began to climb once more, closing in 1882 in November, zooming through 20 by December 20 by December 12th, 25 by December 26th, 34.45 on December 31st, and then $38.85 on January 2nd. A spectacular climb. The hunts were doing very well indeed. But those who were short the market were contemplating a leap from their penthouses. The response to these changes? Change the rules some more. Keep changing them to cheat the hunts. Within a period of two weeks, three new rules were imposed. On March the 27th, Black Thursday they're calling it, the market nosedived. The price dropped to just over $10 an ounce, and the hunt syndicate lost well over $2 billion that day in paper profits. What had happened was that Beish, Hunt's principal broker, had asked their client for more cash to cover the debts he had built up during his buying spree. Beish was in danger because of the market practice of buying silver on credit, on margin as it's called. If the price falls, the broker demands more money or margin to cover himself. When Bunker Hunt ignored the margin call, Beish sent one of their men down to Washington to the CFTC, the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, set up in 1975 to police the market. Elliot J. Smith, a base director, asked the CFTC either to close down the market to give them time to recover, or force Hunt to settle out his contracts. My interview, uh, or discussion with the, with the staff members of the CFTC and with the commissioners, they advised me that they might consider, A, stopping trading, for two or three days let the market settle down but they would not in any way settle out the contracts they advised me that morning that they had word from the bank of england that if they stopped trading it would be considered by the european market as a very bearish point of view what the Bank of England was telling the CFTC in no uncertain terms was that by closing the silver market, they risked a major financial collapse on both sides of the Atlantic. As it turned out, the Commission decided to do nothing and let Beish take their chance when business started the following day. The situation was serious, potentially grave, but there's a philosophical line that has to be drawn. 
The CFTC is here to protect small customers and commercial users of the commodities markets. It is not here to protect large speculators and the brokerage houses that seek their business. That's what closing would have done. How far do you think this whole affair has damaged the confidence of the people that you seek to protect, the small investors, in commodity trading here in the United States? I would say that it has made people far more aware of the speculative, sometimes dangerously speculative nature of these markets. It will therefore make them more cautious. The lesson is probably uh, all to the good in that respect. But could it happen again? It could conceivably happen again. I don't think the tools we had available were strong enough to stop it. I think those tools should be put in place so it can't happen again. We can't take a risk that something which comes out of a, simply a desire for excessive speculation is going to tear the financial fabric of the United States. We cannot take that risk again. Then the final touch to sabotage the silver market. The third of three rule changes on January 21st, 1980. New York Comics again changed the rules in the middle of the game by suspending all trading except for liquidation purposes and no deliveries while raising margin requirements to the highest level in history of the exchanges. The Chicago Board of Trade imposed similar restrictions the next day. This meant you couldn't sell unless you were long and you couldn't buy unless you were short. Even if you were willing and able to put up the 50000 initial margin the exchanges were demanding, you would not be permitted to buy except to cover your short position. Longs were not permitted to buy in the new market. They were excluded. Stacking the deck in favor of the short sellers who wanted the price to drop down far enough so they could get out of their positions. This effectively killed the silver futures market in America. The shorts, which congressional hearings later revealed to include members of the exchanges and members of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission itself, had used their influence to intervene and sabotage the market to swindle the hunts. As Bunker Hunt was later to lament, quote, there was no way to sell anything except at a distressed price. The shorts were sitting on the comics board, and we were sitting down here in Dallas long, trusting them. Unquote. Greatly disenfranchised by the whole outrage, Bunker Hunt observes, quote, All those exchanges are run by the shorts, and with the connivance of the shorts. There are 23 people on the comics board. I've heard at least half of them made a huge amount of money. They positioned themselves the day before the big January 21st liquidation vote. They didn't even have the silver bullion. They just sold short. They knew they could break the market because they were the guys voting, unquote. Herbert Hunt's analogy about the referees at a football game changing the rules in the fourth quarter was right as far as it went. Now players from the other side had climbed into costumes as referees to make absolute certain their team won. Suddenly the game was being run with all the fairness and equity of a lynching. The series of margin hikes and position limits was bad enough. Those drove out small buyers and forced large traders to dispose of their contracts. The effect was to make the market increasingly liquid and cash poor. Between September 28, 1979 and February 1, 1980, the number of outstanding contracts had dropped 53% on the Comex and more than 69% on the CBOT, but the liquidation-only rule was the final move of the vested insiders to rescue themselves as short players and sandbag the hunts. Oh, I, I would buy about 200 lots at 850 on silver, looking for 10 pounds on the upside. Given the financial position you've got at the moment, 200 lots seems reasonable at this level, because the Arabs are going to move in later. They've been buying through the Dresdner Bank at current levels, and I think over the short term you're going to see 9 pounds, 50, 10 pounds at the current level. The silver market in London, second only to New York in size, felt the shock waves at the same instant. British and American brokers are in constant touch by phone, so if New York is hurting, so will London. Dealing rooms on both sides of the Atlantic have been busy since March the 27th, clearing up the mess. So far, the big brokerage houses like Beish have either absorbed their losses, in some cases even made money out of the collapse. The banks are still smarting, although only one small New York broker has actually gone to the wall owing four and a half billion dollars. David Hargreaves is managing director of one of London's bigger silver brokers, Rayner Harwell. The atmosphere of Black Thursday is something he'll never forget. OK, and I'll call you back on that train. Thank you. What was it like here in the silver market in London on the day? Panicky in the extreme because you had a lot of people phoning, trying to save themselves money. Nobody was making money, everyone was trying to save money. What were they saying? They were saying, sell me out. 
basically that sell me out. And after a time, it became sell me out at any price, which, of course, engenders a falling market. How much money do you think went down the drain that day? Well, if we consider that probably three to four hundred million ounces of silver was trading on the market, and it dropped by an average of five pounds an ounce over the time, that's one and a half billion pounds. When the margin call went out to Bunker Hunt from his, uh, from his brokers, why do you think he didn't meet it? After all, he's not exactly broke. No, now there are two stories going around, and I subscribed to the latter. One was, he couldn't meet it. The second was, he wanted it to fall. But I think the extent of the fall overcame even his ambitions. He wanted a, a setback so he could buy more. I think the degree of the fall really took him by surprise as well. Congressional investigations of the silver swindle were soon launched. Hearings held by Senator William Proxmire's Senate Banking Committee have turned up substantial evidence of conflict of interest on the part of the members of the exchanges and possibly certain members of the CFTC also. Based on data provided to the committee by the Commodity Futures Trading Commission itself, Proxmire revealed that at least nine of the 23 members of the Board of Governors of the COMEX were holding enormous short positions which would have required them to deliver more than 38 million ounces of silver bullion worth about $1.9 billion in January when silver was still near its peak. This amounts to one of the greatest plunders by conflict of interest in financial history. Bunker Hunt guesstimates that, on paper, some 50 to $20 billion may have changed hands between the time silver was at or near its peak of 50 and the time it dropped to $10.80 an ounce. This includes all of the traders involved, the whole market, not just the hunts. Bunker acknowledges that he was aware all along that the comics and the CBOT had the power to make rule changes at any time they wanted, but any such rule changes, he explains, were supposed to be neutral in their effect on the market players. The extreme and rapid rule changes by the exchanges were anything but market neutral. On that basis, the Hunts are contemplating a legal suit against the comics for its role in the silver debacle. Comics may someday need to be renamed the Hunt Commodities Exchange. The whole episode demonstrates the classic tendency of government regulatory agencies to take side with special interests within the industry under regulation. Government intervention is never quote-unquote market neutral and can only help some at the forced expense of others. The commodity exchanges made their disruptive rule changes in conflict with previous contract obligations with knowing approval of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission. The culprits in this financial episode were not the hunt entrepreneurs, but those engaged in collusion between the government, CFTC, and special interests in the exchange. Through all this, the major media have nonetheless attempted to make the Hunts look like stereotypical capitalist villains consumed by their own greed. Bunker Hunt, who has no use for the media moguls of the liberal establishment, understands the game very well. As he puts it, the same guys that were able to break the market were also able to get the media to attack its victims, which happened to be us. From the point of view of the insiders of international banking and their kept press, the Hunts represent a colossal threat to a power structure based on paper money. They still do. The story of the Hunt brothers' overuse of leverage, gambling inside the government and often short side controlled commodity derivative price discovery markets, and their naive understanding of the power they were going up against, is simply a lesson for the modern day silver squeeze movement. By simply having a long term time horizon, knowing the unscalable debts and unfunded promise piles we collectively face, silver bullion buyers and PSLV longs should know to take prudent bets over the long haul. Take the advice of Nelson Bunker Hunt's words from January 1980. Make note not to repeat his short-sighted actions. Buy your bullion with fiat cash saved. Use no margin or leverage. And over the long pull, your bets should pay off soundly. That's all for this look back at the first alleged silver squeeze in this full fiat currency era. Subscribe to our channel and stay tuned for how this ongoing rhyme in silver market history turns out in the months and years to come. And as always... Take great care of yourselves and those you love. If you enjoyed this content, be sure to give our video a thumbs up. To keep getting bullion related news and industry insights, be sure to subscribe to our channel. Finally, hit that alert button so you know when we publish fresh content. Give us your thoughts in the comments below. Let us know what you think and which topics you want to hear more about.